Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and welcome to Lecture 4B of Construction Site Management. Today we're going to be looking at, further looking at documentation used on the job site, and in particular, we're going to spend a little bit of time on uh, meetings and how to run an effective meeting. We'll be doing some subsets of that in the rest of the course, but just to get a good understanding of how to run you know, overall a project meeting. There's all kinds of specialized types of meetings, but the processes are very similar. So, uh, we're going to be uh, looking at uh, the documentation and record keeping processes in construction, and we'll start off with some of the primary areas that we want to cover are conversations, costs, correspondence, contractual requirements, and how to conduct an effective meeting, as I mentioned. So some of the primary purposes of uh, cost documentation. So we've looked in the previous lecture of uh, uh, different types of information on the project. We talked about schedules, documenting time. Well, the other key area is cost documentation. So uh, how do we monitor our costs and how do we track our costs? And there's usually time cards that are filled out by employees or if you're a subcontractor your employees are filling them out and they can be using that productivity software methodology that i was talking about but some sort of method of gathering information where where were you working and what were you working on and then what you were working on has some associated cost code so that that cost code is tied into a budget and so what was the plan for the budget and then the amounts of time with a dollar amount per hour can be associated with that budget and then that can be monitored. So the monitoring of costs are done in the direction of labor which is probably the most difficult to track, uh, material which is somewhat easier and equipment, right? Um, so those are the three areas and labor is always the most volatile area of monitoring costs on a construction project because it depends how efficient people are working. Costs, other costs we can usually um, figure out pretty well beforehand unless we make some sort of critical omission or of that nature. So uh, correspondence back and forth is a major part form of documentation. Uh, you know, uh, making sure that we're referencing the proper uh, project and number and we give a good description we want to if we're going to be corresponding on something the better clarity we have um, the more important that is I have a link at the end of the video to a uh, Procore a Procore aspect of um, doing a punch list and that kind of correspondence is really it's clear it's you're tying a photographic image to what needs to be fixed you know you're writing in what needs to be done you make it as crystallized as possible, there's less likelihood of somebody misunderstanding something. So there's letter of transmittal. Uh, usually we're doing all of this uh, electronically. Uh, so again, who sent it, what's it regarding, etc. And RFIs, I think we already covered in an earlier lecture, but request for information. And really it's clarification or there's something that wasn't correct or there's an error or an omission in the project documents and you just want to know which way to go like what's what's going to be the answer for this so you're trying to get a clarification in writing so that uh, you're also protected that way so RFI might look something like uh, this example that I have here Belmont Lake Community Center the scope of work describes the environmentally sensitive area at the rear of the ravine um, have there been any environmental reviews completed to the surrounding property? And if so, uh, can we be provided with a copy? And then you're even putting a date, request a response by February 26. And so you can track that because that's, that becomes important if you needed that information in order to get the work um, going on. In this particular case, it's going to Alexandra Baylor, executive chair of the Belmont Lake Community Center. So that would be the client to the client from the actual uh, contractor so um, or uh, might be delivered to their consultant as well all right so again that's um, that uh, uh, action and um, we're there okay so uh, letters 
Usually letters are not used that frequently anymore because it takes too much time. You got to put them in the mail. Usually letters are something like you're taking this to the nth degree and you're documenting it in writing and it may be a registered letter, etc. because it's got something to do with a claim or some legal action. Uh, but really it's, it's, it's putting a sense of urgency in it. Uh, maybe emails didn't work that well before and now you've uh, upped it, whatever it is. Uh, emails, though, on the other hand, are used universally and usually in some sort of document management system so you can more easily track the emails on a particular project. But regardless, uh, they are utilized uh, because it's, um, it's a um, quick, efficient way of uh, sending uh, requests and information. And of course, today, uh, in today's work environment, it's, it's no longer acceptable to leave things on your hard drive. And then, of course, you drop the laptop or you drop the computer or it just dies on you and you lose all that information. You want to keep that information uh, available. So the best way to secure it is into some sort of document management system. And then your drives and everything also, if the company drives on any software, they're backed up into the cloud somewhere onto a server so that um, they can easily be accessed if things go um, down on your systems uh, directly. Always want to have backups. The more backups you have, the better. Uh, I found uh, that out a few years back. I think I was marking a student's assignment and there was a virus in it and I got this ransom note saying I had to pay $10,000 and it locked all my files. Uh, there, so there was nothing I could do about the files and what surprised me is it even went into my Dropbox account and started to lock up all of my Dropbox files. Uh, so at that time I didn't ha pay the extra for the backup of Dropbox but fortunately uh, being as untrusting as I am uh, I had several hard drive backups so I did lose about a week's worth of uh, stuff but I didn't lose everything which was very important uh, that way. So multiple layers of protection is a good thing in our kind of world that we live in where things aren't always secure. Uh, that'd be the same for your assignments and stuff. You put it on a, a memory stick, good luck because the memory stick's going to disappear. Uh, most of the drives, and I'm pretty sure you can use um, uh, the Microsoft Drive uh, as a student at George Brown, will back things up to a second um, cloud to the cloud and then if it's on your laptop then you've got two at least but even more than that I would go after myself. So contractual requirements, project startup, uh, so we have to have a construction schedule. We were talking about that earlier uh, in lecture 4a. Schedule of values, that's really a breakdown of the costs. It sounds like this fancy uh, word but it's a breakdown of the costs uh, so if you have a work breakdown structure on your project, you'll have it broken down into areas and then your billing is going to be based on what you've said these amounts and areas are worth of the overall project. Uh, so your billings tie to the schedule of values. So that's in a very important um, element to make sure that that's been signed off on early so that now when you do your billings, whoever the consultant is, they'll be verifying, okay, they've got this done. They said this was worth this much. We checked this already. And then that's when the payment will start. Listing of subcontractors that will be working on the projects. And we've already talked about submittals, shop drawings and samples and uh, keeping a log of uh, that information as well. So when the construction's in progress, if we have a schedule of values, you're going to make progress payments based on what work was done and, and the value of that work. And so uh, that's important. You'll do the construction schedule updates like we mentioned. You'll have a schedule narrative that you'll fill out. You'll provide that to the client. You'll have uh, payrolls and you'll have contract change orders uh, to do. Payrolls, you're going to make sure that your, your payrolls that you're paying out match with the people that were on the site and the hours that they worked. Again, that's where having uh, job logs are, are good and time cards are good so that you can verify who was on the project when there's any discrepancies and of course project closeout requires a whole bunch of documentation on itself it's another entity project closeout is when you complete the job what do you have to provide to the client when you finish uh, the project so that they can pay 
out the project, they can release any holdback monies, and now the project is considered to be closed. So there's a whole bunch in this, uh, information in the specifications regarding uh, closeout requirements. There may be some information in the supplemental conditions of the contract, uh, but you have to follow that um, carefully and make sure that all of that documentation is gathered and prepared and provided to the client when you're closing out the project. And some of the information you need probably should be collected as the project is proceeding. You don't wait till the end to try to go after it and uh, get information from other parties. That becomes a really, really um, slow and arduous process. Rather collect it, know what you need and collect it as it's being produced. So gets us to how to run an effective meeting. So how, how do we run, lead an effective meeting? Has anybody been in meetings? If you're thinking about yourself, what do you not like about meetings? What don't you like about meetings? If you've worked for a while, there will definitely be some things. So think about that for a minute. What don't you like about a meeting? And if you're like me, uh, some of the things that you don't like are meetings that don't start on time, meetings that end late, meetings where somebody takes over the meeting, has their own agenda, interrupts all the time, uh, meetings that don't have a clear agenda, why are we even having this meeting, meetings that don't follow an agenda, Meetings where it seems like the person running the meeting is just going through the motions. Not having the right people at the meetings. These are some, just a few things that come up as to why people don't like meetings. So on the plus side, if you run a really effective meeting, you're going to stand out. You want to stand out you want to move up the ladder, you want to do well in this industry, run an effective meeting. People will appreciate you. People will respect you because you respect them and their time. These are things to think about when you're running a meeting. Some people just think it's just another thing. This is your chance to lead the project. We don't often get the chances to lead a project and so when you're given the task of running a meeting, take ownership of it and work on doing it well. Everybody has their kind of talents. You can ask yourself after you do your first meeting, what could I have done better? What could I have changed? What could I have made better? And you will find if you keep doing that over time, you will run a very effective meeting. But it takes time and it takes effort. So that would be clear advice that I would take. The other thing I would do in your careers as you're starting out, watch people. Watch people who do a really good meeting. Put yourself in that position and ask yourself, what could I do to make it even better? Watch people who run a poor meeting. Ask yourself, what did you not like about that? What could you do to change that? What would you avoid doing yourself? And that's going to put you on a very good pathway for success at leading projects and to lead projects you need to be able to run effective meetings because there's a lot of talented people in construction and your job as a construction manager is to pull out those talents those skills that knowledge base and collaborate that together to engage the people involved in it so that you run a very effective project that is capitalizing on everybody's breadth of knowledge. So let's go through these slides. I think I've gotten a few of them crystallized. There's probably a few things that I didn't get through, but um, definitely uh, you want to ask yourself these questions because it gives you better understanding, right? And what are the be meeting behaviors that are most difficult to manage and how can we manage them better? And really thinking about these points. So take a few minutes, you know, from this lecture and crystallize that. All right, so as I said, it defines the project teams, the participants, their roles. 
It's where the group revises, it updates, it adds, it problem solves, it coordinates. It helps every individual understand both the collective goals and aims. It's another opportunity to reinforce the goals that you have. And in the agenda, you should be having a meeting to help you achieve your goals, which means you need to know what the goals are for this meeting. Uh, so um, it's a way in which their own and everyone else's uh, work can contribute to the group's success. In every meeting, I see people and I have people uh, there's some introverts, there's some extroverts. Just keep in mind, sometimes the quietest person in the room is the smartest person in the room. So figure out ways to engage that person. If you ask them a question before the meeting, I, you know, Jonathan, I need to tap you about this because I know you know a lot on this particular area, so um, just be prepared. I don't want to surprise you during the meeting. If somebody's an introvert, they might not want that. You figure out ways to engage people. Um, there's this uh, book that was written, a very interesting book. It's, um, it's called Smarter, Faster, Better, right? So Smarter, Faster, Better. And in it, um, Charles uh, Duhigg, who also wrote The Power of Habit, another very good book, um, he talks about uh, Lauren Michaels, who writes Saturday Night Live. And Saturday Night Live has been around since I was in high school. It's a long-running show. It's on every Saturday night. And there were some very big comedians that came out of uh, Saturday night, either in their writings or in their uh, acting careers. You know, Larry David, uh, lots of people. And John Belushi back in the day um, was one of them. And um, Lauren Michaels said in the book, he said, you know what? Uh, John Belushi, very often he was quiet and they had to put the, together a show in one week. And he goes, here I got this super comedian and when we have these meetings, you just sit there quiet. So I had to figure out ways to draw him in. And once I drew him in, then the comedy started. Then he had all these ideas and he'd bring them out. But I always had to figure a way to engage him. So he said from that he learned that in every meeting he finds a way to engage everybody in the process to make sure they're valued, they know they're valued, and then they will contribute. So it's very helpful to keep that in mind. You'd be surprised uh, how sometimes the thing that nobody expects from somebody actually ends up being uh, something that is like beyond comprehension. So uh, we've got that to consider. We want, we want to make sure that uh, we have uh, we have all those that are present that they can make, they can commit to decisions. All right. Uh, so we want to make sure that we have uh, people that are decision makers at the meeting. It doesn't help us much if we have some representative of subtrade and they're like, no, I can't really make that decision. I can't make that decision. That's useless to us, right? We want to make sure that we have the proper decision making makers there. And as I said, this is where you get to have everybody work together and um, to um, lead your project, right? So before a meeting, you want to set the goals. Why are we having this? If you've got no reason to have it, don't have it. Cancel it. Keep meetings as short as possible. So don't make a meeting drag out any longer than necessary. If it's going to be an hour meeting, make sure it doesn't go longer than an hour. I've never had somebody stop me an hour into a, a 45 minutes into a meeting when I finish the meeting ahead of time I say Tom what's going on we're finished 20 minutes early we're finished 15 minutes early I don't get it like why are you never uh, and if it did happen I've long forgotten it's so rare uh, it's almost like uh, students you know if you have a class and you go an hour and a half instead of two hours if you gave the content and it was a good well-prepared class they will be happy with that information. On the other hand, if it's, if it's an hour and a half and it's like disorganized and not very well presented, then they won't. So you have to look at the content. It's about the content. If you're able to get that content out in a quicker fashion, then that's great. Uh, how do you do that? You prepare an agenda. You make sure the agenda is circulated ahead of time. So if people need to collect things or to respond to things during the meeting, they've had appropriate time to do so. So at least 24 hours, maybe even sooner. Um, so that's definite. Start and finish on time. I've had sometimes where even I'm doing presentations and it's sort of like, oh, Charlie's on the, on the highway. He'll be here in 15 minutes. Can we wait for Charlie? 
I'm like, no, we're not waiting for Charlie. There's like 20 people here. Uh, why would we wait for Charlie? Charlie should have got up earlier. Um, so start and finish on time. Because then everybody else at that meeting, the other 23 people are going to be like, next week when we meet again, huh, this guy doesn't start on time, I'm going to be late. And then even Charlie, Charlie's going to be an extra 15 minutes late the following week. So it's like an endless circle. Start on time, finish on time. Charlie comes in, maybe you could move his agenda item and then when he comes in, you could deal with it. Or maybe you say to Charlie, you and I'll deal with this later. Uh, so start and finish on time. I was at a meeting at George Brown. Uh, I guess I'm being video recorded, so then I get caught with everything. But anyways, um, at my stage, you don't worry about those two minutes too much. Uh, so I was at a meeting, I guess it was about a year ago, and um, or one of the programs was being reviewed, and the person reviewing it comes in, comes in, does starts the meeting on time, but it was supposed to be an hour-long meeting. I'm looking at the watch, and it's like, 10 to and they're not even covering the agenda items they're going here there everywhere and so then it, the time came it passed maybe by about 10 15 minutes i looked at my watch i looked at the agenda i thought this is going to go another hour and a half so i, I thought i'm not going to sit here for this so i just got up and the person reminded me oh where are you going oh well the meeting was supposed to be over at one i have other appointments i didn't really have other appointments but anyways uh, <laughs> so I, I left because just went on and on and I, I asked one of the faculty later on I said so did it what happened it went on about another hour and a half so you want to value people's time and sometimes you know what I can understand you run over something was more intense and that sort of thing definitely uh, but then you when the time comes you say I'm sorry we've got about another 15 20 minutes I'll try to keep it tight but we really got to work through this and at least you recognize and uh, value other people's time and don't be surprised if somebody else does have another appointment. It's what we do in the real world, right? We have other appointments, other things to go to, other things to do. Um, so uh, you definitely want to keep that in mind and value other people's time. Start and finish on time. And I would apologize profusely if you end up being late, etc. Sometimes we run into technological problems. Zoom is another whole whole thing uh, that we have to get used to with that sort of thing and I'm sure before this course is over I'm sure there'll be one class or two where I start late or uh, well I usually don't I try not to finish late but anyways um, that that kind of process goes on and have somebody take notes for the minutes have somebody be a note taker so that you don't have to, if you're actually doing it, you don't have to take the minutes at the same time. It's distracting trying to do several things at once. Just like it's kind of distracting trying to do a, a Zoom presentation and people are coming and going and stinging and donging and all this other stuff. It is, it is um, taxing on the presenter or the person that's trying to run the meeting. Maybe they won't be quite as energized or effective if they're trying to do two things and they may miss things especially when we're talking about that we need to have good documentation in the minutes of who took accountability to things. So in the minutes, you're making sure the person taking the minutes notes who is accepting the different tasks and responsibilities for things. I've seen meetings where people say, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it. And nobody follows up. And so they get into this. Yeah, I'll do it. They look great in the meeting. Oh, wow, they're doing all these things. They never do anything. Nobody's following up with them. Uh, so uh, another thing is, Take the minutes, send the meetings out as soon as possible. You might as well do the minutes quickly after the meeting, finalize them. You got to do them some point anyways. Sooner is better than later because it'll be more crystallized in your mind. You wait five days before you do it, you've forgotten a lot of it and it's harder to do. So it's much easier when it's much more current and then mail it out as soon as possible. And then you can always email it again. You can email it again just before the meeting. The worst is when I go into a meeting and then the person running the meeting says, oh, did you read the minutes? And I go, no, uh, when did you send? I think I missed it on my email. Oh, I sent about five minutes ago. Well, gee, uh, I'm on the, my way to this meeting. How would I have time to read it, right? Uh, so that's not much help then. That's the person in reactive mode that's running the meeting that's not very prepared for it, that sends signals that way. Especially construction meetings, because there's a lot of responsibilities in those meetings. And you would want to get it out too, because you want people to see, oh, yeah, I did say yes to that. 
And then if I'm running the meeting, if I need that person to have it done, maybe by Wednesday, I would do a follow up call to them to see how are they progressing on that. If it's something I didn't need before the next meeting, at the next meeting, I would call them out. I'd say, oh, how are we on that agenda item from, from the minutes last week? And you know what? If they don't didn't do anything, they don't like being outside, you know, in the center of the meeting. How do, how's the progress on this? They'd be like, oh, I didn't get to it yet. Okay, we'll talk about this after the meeting. And then, you know what? People start to see, oh, this person uh, has accountabilities in place for the people that agree to what they're supposed to do. I better do them or I better have a good valid reason why I couldn't do it. And then, you know what? The whole team starts actually participating and doing things. And it's not just lip service. Meetings shouldn't be about lip service. Meetings shouldn't be about somebody wanting to put on a show. Uh, meetings should be about setting goals, meeting goals, and clearing obstacles out of the way so that you've got a clear path. You got to sort of think about it that way. If you kind of go think about meetings as a waste of time, then you're not doing them effectively. That would be what I would say. And that can be very helpful for you to uh, be able to um, ensure that your meetings went well. So uh, those, are, those are some of the points and um, making sure that um, you follow through on these points uh, is important. So the other, the last point too here I'd want to make is that sometimes people want to take your meetings off track and there's always somebody. If that's the case, well, you know, I run classes, right? So there's sometimes students that want to take things off track. And a certain, you know, if it's a good question, that's fine. And it's related to the course, that's fine. But I mean, there's some, it's just, and usually I'll, I'll say something like, we'll take this offline, you and I, after class, or you can ask me after class. There's no point in disrupting the whole class. There's no point in disrupting the whole meeting by this one person. And yet in the construction world, in meetings, this does tend to happen. Usually it's some, you know, kind of um, pretty, uh, pretty good extrovert uh, that uh, has their own agenda, whatever it is, uh, you know, can be anything. And it has nothing to do with your meeting. If you can pick up on that, and you, you don't have to, you don't have to be rude or impolite. You can be very professional about it. Charlie, I'm picking on Charlie. Uh, Charlie, you and I can take this offline afterwards and we'll discuss it, right? And then when you meet with Charlie, maybe it is a valid thing to Charlie, but not to the other 20 people, then you can deal with it. You can deal with it very professionally. Or if it's not something that's very pal valid, you can at least answer that and say the reasons why. And you don't have to get into it in the middle of the meeting. You want to be conscious of those things because there are, they do occur, right? And sometimes I get caught too, and in the first class I don't catch it, but then usually by class two or class three, I'm kind of aware of it. And then I'm on to uh, certain tools and techniques that are used to try to circumvent um, those situations. And it can be really effective in running meetings, and people appreciate that, that are, you know, they got, everybody's got limited time and you wanna prioritize it. You don't wanna be sitting in meetings longer than necessary. So um, that's kind of the, the aspects of that and um, the progress process and how that works. The other thing with meetings is I will usually on, in construction projects, just like your classes, your classes are a certain time every week, right? And so you get into a very habit and routine. After about two, three weeks, you don't even have to look at a schedule. You know it's Tuesday, I gotta go here. You know it's Monday at eight o'clock, I gotta go there. If you set that format with your meetings, that's very helpful. So uh, when I was project manager for technology for the construction of e-building, um, I was dealing with the VPs, I was dealing with the chairs and the deans, I was dealing with facilities manager. And so, and I was leading that part of it. So I set up at the beginning a time where we could all meet and everybody cleared it off their calendar for the next six months. So it ended up being the only time we could find was like Thursday mornings at 7.15. So we would all meet Thursday mornings at 7.15. Everybody would gather, we'd have our, our construction meeting and determine is everything being, is the, is the content for what we need in the building, everything being satisfied, and then we go. 
it worked very, very well. And um, it took a half an hour, the first meeting. It took a long time, the first meeting, to get everything coordinated. But once it was coordinated, then it was like people leave their doors Thursday morning. And they know where they're going. They don't think about it. That's just automatic. It's You've built in this habit. You've built in this routine. Wherever you can build, systemize these things. We talked about goals and systems. Things become easier. So with um, document management, that's what I wanted to cover on meetings. Uh, document management uh, systems. Uh, I mentioned that you want to have things that are dynamic. You have one point of entry and it actually works. Uh, I put this, uh, this YouTube video up. Uh, which is on uh, Procore, and it's actually not bad. Maybe I'll see if it picks up the, the volume. So we'll try this and see if this um, works, uh, whether my mic will pick up the volume um, well enough, and see how uh, this goes. It's about a five-minute video. It's on punch list, but I want you to look on the side panel. Uh, it gives a list of all the documents that are in the system. It's not all the documents, but it's a good preview of the documents. And most of those documents are the ones that we've just been talking about. So you get a better sense of it. And you can see how you can communicate with pictures and photo documentation. This ties to lecture 4A as well, going back to um, that. So let's see. And we'll see if there's any volume where I got to do the volume. You're in the home stretch. Well, let's talk about it. Many of you watching this video may use some sort of spreadsheet tool like Excel for tracking punch list items at the end of a project. This is oftentimes very inefficient because we need to walk the site with a pen and paper and a camera to take notes and pictures of the vision items. Then you return to your computer, upload the photos, enter in each field, and distribute the punch list around the site and hope that you didn't miss anything. With Procore, you can cut this process to two steps in one device. Step one, create the punch list item. Step two, mark the item as closed when the work is completed. Let's take this step by step. When it comes time to walk the site for punch list items, all you need is your tablet or smartphone and the Procore app. Notice the list at the, the side, side. It's submittals, to be as RFIs, as possible, meetings, not only in recognizing schedule, item, but also daily log, photos, specific drawings, documents, can in a manner that is time and cost effective to all parties. This is why you're going to start the punch list process from the drawings tool. Doing this streamlines several processes. It places the punch list item right on its location to prevent confusion for the subcontractor. It saves you time when creating it by eliminating clicks as you switch between the drawings and punch list tools. Finally, it saves you time down the road as you'll be able to use these markups to create your as built right on your drawing. With this drawing-centric project management in mind, let's open up our floor plan. All right, pretend you're at Shoreline Park right now doing final walkthroughs and you come across a white paint spot on the green door frame to the fourth district super's office, which you can see here. To drop a punch list item, you'll choose the punch pin tool from our markup tools on the right. Remember that if you need a refresher on each of these tools, you're always welcome to watch the drawings training video again. Now, when we first select the location of our punch pin, we'll be able to create our punch list item right away. First, we're going to add a title. Let's call it Fix Paint. We're going to leave the item open because it hasn't been resolved yet, and add a location. We can call out the specified location where the punch list item is by choosing from a list of locations, or we can add a new location to associate with this item. The due date is going to be a week from now since this is an easy fix, but it's not urgent. If the punch list tools administrator set up punch list types associated with the project, we can add a punch list item type. We're going to assign the punch list item to Patricia, the paint subcontractor from our directory, by searching for her name in contacts and clicking done. Add a detailed description so Patricia doesn't have to come to us for more information once she begins working. Finally, we're going to take and attach a picture in one step right from the mobile device. We can either choose from pictures we've already taken from our device, or we can take one right now. Let's take one right now since I'm standing in front of the paint spot as we speak. We can mark up the picture to pinpoint the exact place of the deficiency using these familiar markup tools. And when we're done, click save. We can add as many pictures as we like. When we're done, click save again. And that's it. 
In just a few minutes, you created a punch list item with a picture that was distributed to the assignee's email inbox when you clicked save. And it's already been linked to an exact location on the drawing. If your subcontractors have gone through the subcontractor certification, they should know how to respond to this punch list item and mark it as resolved. When they do so, you'll receive an email immediately notifying you that the punch list item requires your attention. Subcontractors can even attach a photo so that you'll know right away from your email if a subcontractor did the work when he or she resolved the item. Once you're ready to confirm the work, go to the location with your tablet or smartphone and close the item out while you're looking at it. We can go to our drawing, click edit, and mark the item as closed. Or we can go into the punch list tool and click on the item we want to close. You will be presented with all open items or items that haven't been resolved and closed and that are assigned to you. You can always click all and close in any combination and even search by keyword to filter the punch list items to what you want to see. If you can see, all of the information you added is readily available, including the picture you took. The only difference is that Patricia has now uploaded a picture and marked the item as resolved. It looks good from where I'm standing too, so I'm gonna mark it as closed. There's two ways to do this. You can click edit, close, and then save, or the easiest way to do this is by drawing a check mark over the punch list item with your finger on the screen of the mobile device. Once I do this, it notifies Patricia that she has completed the item and lets the PM and anyone who can see the item in Procore's punch list pool know that the item is closed. There are a few other punch list items that need to be reviewed, so let's take a look at those as well. We can click into another item, and if it looks good on our end, which it does to me, we'll mark it as closed, and Procore will send a notification to the subcontractor once it's done. Let's click into another item. Even though Max did add the custom trash cabinet, it conflicts with the existing kitchen drawers when you try to open it. So we're going to mark this unresolved again. We can click Edit and add a note that the cabinet conflicts. We'll now click Update. Just like when we close an item, when we mark an item unresolved, Procore will send a subcontractor a notification email that the item needs attention again, all in one simple step. Once you resolve the item to your satisfaction, you can mark it as closed. If you follow this process, it'll save you tons of time between creation, communication, and closure of punch list items. So that's pretty much what I wanted to cover uh, in this uh, lecture. Um, as far as I'll load these slides up on uh, Blackboard, but as far as uh, the last slide that's there, it, it mentions Procore, Bluebeam, Fieldwire, Plan Grid. These are like four productivity softwares. Uh, that are very popular. So again, Procore, Plan Grid, Fieldwire, um, and Bluebeam. Uh, very widely used in the construction industry. They kind of all do more or less the same thing, but they all do it a little bit different ways. So, you know, your best bet is, I think in some of your estimating courses, you may use Bluebeam. Your best bet though, whatever company you end up working with, just figure out the best way to use that particular software. That's my kind of view of things. I don't get too hung up on any one software. I just go with the flow with a software and then it's like, oh, okay, let's figure this out. Oh, okay, let Zoom. Okay, let's figure this out. Uh, Blackboard Collaborate. Okay, let's figure this out. Where are the pluses and minus with this? Uh, you know, uh, Teams. I use Teams in the summer. I use Collaborate in the spring and I'm using Zoom right now. So I'm just trying to uh, digest all of the different uh, pluses and minuses. Same thing with productivity software, but you're not going to be able to choose because it's going to be whatever your company or if you're working with a subcontractor, whatever your company is using or whatever the GC is requiring you use on this particular project. So um, that's how that works. But the names of those items, as you saw by the list down the side, it's everything we've been talking about. Submittals, RFIs, logs, photo documentation, schedules, all of these are standard documents. It doesn't matter what form they are, but they're standard documents. But I would say today we want them in some digital form for the most part. Otherwise, things disappear. Okay, 
So I hope you enjoyed uh, this uh, lecture. I know I actually enjoyed this uh, lecture because I, I find talking about meetings and engagements and motivations and leadership and that sort of thing uh, exciting because I think that's how you get things done. That's how you build great things. That's how you uh, get uh, great relationships going. And that's how we really you enjoy this area this field it's it's a fantastic field and when people work together it's it's amazing to watch it's like watching the raptors last year how they came together as a team and how they came in sync and how they had each other's backs that's um, exciting so it's not that much different in a lot of ways believe me so i'm tom stevenson signing off for now and we will see you soon bye for now